Uh, it's been a wonderful two days for me, um, mostly because of you people being here. Um, I was um, really looking forward to um, having you all together, so many old friends here and so many new friends, and it's been really great to see the mingling of the communities and, and lots of little areas of common interest. And I, I hope that um, some of the meetings you've had uh, over the last two days will foster longer term collaboration. Um, uh, I um, didn't expect it to be uh, such a fascinating meeting. It's been, um, of course, diverse, and, um, but we've had some really great talks and um, inspirational talks, and I, I thank you all um, for that. I, um, of course, we had the limitations of two days, and we would have liked to ask many more people to speak, and in particular, we've had uh, almost nobody from the home team speaking. Um, and uh, that's simply because we needed to do justice to our international visitors. Uh, not that you didn't have anything to say. <laughs> um, I'm going to um, give you a perspective, um, a bit of a personal perspective on my journey through science. And, um, and I'm going to close with a vision for the future that's a challenge for you all, but also particularly for the young faculty that we've been appointing and who will be carrying the torch for the next few decades. So, um, where's Jeff? Okay, president of the AGU hydrology section. The AGU hydrology section was formed in 1930. And uh, in the AGU meeting of um, 1931, um, Horton made some comments about hydrology as a science. So hydrology has is, is really had to fight for its emergence as an earth science and its um, uh, true membership of the AGU. So he talked about science, uh, the hydrology as a science, dealing with the natural occurrence, distribution, and circulation of water. Um, and the field of hydrology, its job is to trace out and account for the phenomena of the hydrological cycle. Now, I'm an engineer, and actually I did a degree in engineering science, uh, and I'm really motivated by solving societal problems. And Horton um, was there before me because he said, uh, the scope and problems of hydrology are closely related to various branches of applied hydrology, and this is natural since it's mainly in the applications that new problems arise and the scope of the science is extended. And um, that's certainly be a theme um, for my work, but I think it's also been a theme that's really strongly emerged throughout the two days um, of, of, of meetings. So let me just talk a little bit about um, observational uh, and experimental programs. And um, as somebody remarked, it's been perhaps a characteristic of much of my work that uh, it's involved observations and experimental and field programs and bringing that together with models. And um, when I did my PhD um, a very, very long time ago, um, in, in the 70s, then I was working on a problem which was to do with the hydrological impacts of urbanization. So um, uh, this was a, a study that was um, very much in vogue in the an issue that was in, important in the 60s and, and to some extent in the 70s. The problem I looked at was that um, the areas of South Gloucestershire which were subject to large-scale urban development and they were low-lying, poorly drained, what was going to be impact on the, on the flood regime. And so what we did was to go out and instrument catchments um, so that we understood their functioning. It was, I was wandering around with a neutron probe in the very early days of neutron probes and, um, uh, and then building models and then we, we set up a, a quite a large number of catchments of varying degrees of urbanization and then we did some regional analysis. <clears throat> this was really part of a large body of work at that time which really cracked the problem of uh, urbanization. So we know what the impacts are, we've got good tools to be able to predict those and they are currently used in um, uh, uh, a standard practice in uh, urban design. In fact, uh, I had some meetings a couple of weeks ago with planners from Chicago, and um, 
uh, they were very much talking about the role of green infrastructure as a way of managing these problems into the 21st century. So <clears throat> a theme of um, observing systems, understanding systems, modeling solutions, and then producing tools. Um, so we talked a little bit about Arizona hydrology. It popped up today. Um, and I had a very exciting time um, as a young academic in 1981 going out to Oman. Oman was a, really a wonderful place, um, and is a wonderful place, but uh, it was in the Middle Ages till about 1971. And uh, Sultan Qaboos, who's still hanging on there, came to power. He um, uh, had a coup, uh, uh, took over from his father. Um, and they did a lot of work to expand the infrastructure. They built roads, houses, schools. Um, he's been a very benign ruler over many decades. But they hadn't really thought about floods. And then 1981, they had a major flood. And um, this was um, just one example. This was a brand new road um, that was about to be handed over by the contractor uh, to the client. Um, but after the storm, the only thing that was left were the culverts. <laughs> <laughs> Oman's an interesting place. The average precipitation per year is 100 millimeters. Uh, in Muscat, uh, you can get that in, in uh, a couple of hours, which is what happened in this storm. Um, they had, uh, later on in the 90s, um, 480 millimeters. And then later on in the 2000s, they actually had a 900 millimeter storm, which uh, exceeded the PMP. So a very interesting regime. And that, um, I had such a lot of fun flying around in helicopters, um, but we did a great study, and that started me on a, um, a route uh, along the arid zone pathway. And the next step was a really important one because um, uh, we, uh, I got involved in a project in Saudi Arabia, a five wadis study, and that really, for the first time, instrumented basins in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula so that we could get a, a, a good grip on the processes um, taking place. And um, we had, so we had 100 rain gauges, dozens of flow gauging stations, groundwater wells, and so on. And uh, the, the, the top picture is um, a really nice slide of the conundrum of arid zone hydrology, because if you look at the sky, you can see it's a beautiful, clear, sunny day. There isn't a cloud in the sky. Um, but there we have this flood moving down the wadi system. Um, and um, if you, uh, this is a, one of the basins that we were looking at. This is a plot of the storm runoff volume and the observed rainfall volume. And um, uh, what you can see is that you can get the biggest runoff volume from the smallest rainfall. Um, and that's a problem for hydrological models. <laughs> and of course, the problem is that the rainfall is falling between the rain gauges. So, uh, uh, so um, these are challenges that um, remain as, as major issues for arid zone and, um, uh, and continue uh, to this day. Um, this, um, as we heard from um, Abdin Sali, and I have to say, Sarush has been a great partner in crime with this. We, f we founded GWADI, and we did a lot of work um, on training, both in the Middle East and globally, and that led to a couple of workshops and some books. So we did work on hydrological modeling uh, in arid and semi-arid areas uh, based on a, a, a workshop in India that uh, Tony, is Tony around still? Yeah, was, was there um, uh, at Rocky. Um And then we had a, a, a groundwater modeling workshop. And is Zinli around? Yeah, it's hosted by Zin in, uh, in Lanchow. Um, and as you already heard from Sarush, one of the uh, products of Jiwadi was uh, Sarush's Persian system. Okay, um, so the 1980s was the arid acid rain era uh, in terms of sulfur emissions. And um, there was a huge political uh, furore about this, um, not only between Canada and the US, uh, but also between Scandinavia and the UK. Margaret Thatcher was in power. She said, <clears throat> British emissions have got nothing to do with acid lakes in Scandinavia. Uh, I'm not going to spend any money on 
emission controls. Anyway, um, it, it was a very hot topic and um, uh, a, a big stimulus in, the, in Europe for research in Scandinavia. And the Royal Society put together uh, an acid rain program to try and um, pull the science together in a sufficiently comprehensive state to convince policymakers. Um, and this was really um, an era of major investment, not only in the UK, but of course in Canada. And um, it, it sort of stimulated the experimental lakes and uh, was a, a real driver uh, for trying to understand for the first time really um, for such an important practical issue how water and its chemistry moves through landscapes with this driver of acid deposition. Um, so we worked in uh, various sites in Scotland to understand uh, the flow paths and the hydrochemistry um, and uh, Jeff referred to some of this work kindly in his early slide. It was a very um, exciting time, um, but most importantly, um, we had a very strong leader of this program. His name was Sir John Mason, a man whose ego would fill the size of any room. <laughs> and he was able to convince Margaret Thatcher to spend a billion pounds on cleaning up sulfur uh, from power stations. So um, this was a kind of success. Um, it, it, um, scientifically, it was, was very interesting. Um, because uh, it, it really raises a whole series of questions which are still uh, not only partially answered. So we did some work at that stage understanding basic processes, but still really struggling to put together process-based models that adequate reproduce the complexity of the hydrology and the geochemistry. It was also my first venture into um, uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research. And it was very interesting because, of course, the freshwater ecologists all knew that they were the most important people because it was the fish that were getting affected. And then the soil scientists really knew that they were the most important people because it was all about soil chemistry. Uh, and then actually the hydrologists, like me, knew it was really the hydrology that was most important because it was all to do with flow paths. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, okay, um, now uh, a little problem of nuclear waste came along, and Adrian talked, um, mentioned this, I think, in, in passing. Um, 1990s, we set up a team to um, work on some of the issues around the safety assessment of uh, uh, um, nuclear waste, and the uh, plan was to uh, build a deep repository, as it is in many places around the world, and then the question is, um, what happens when ultimately, after a thousand years, the physical environment breaks down and then this uh, contamination reaches the natural environment and ultimately comes near surface. So we set up these experiments um, just uh, at Ascot, um, not too far from Windsor Castle. Um, and uh, they were very interesting. We um, created um, lysimeters, we controlled water tables, and we dosed them with radiochemicals, and Ching did her PhD on this, uh, and is here today. Um, now, it was a really interesting piece of science because um, uh, radioisotopes are very, very handy tracers, um, and so we did some really interesting work looking at the interactions between soil chemistry and hydrological fluxes as you move from a, a water table, whoops, as you move from a water table um, up through um, in, into the unsaturated zone. And so this is just a little slide showing that there's actually redox controlled chemical mob mobility uh, for radioiodine. Um, and so this, this sort of opened a, a, a very interesting box, which is as yet unresolved, I think, as to how to model um, chemistry of uh, chemical processes in, in unsaturated soils. And then if you were to add on freezing unsaturated soils, you'd have an even more interesting problem. So there's um, still a major uh, amount of work to be done in, in this area. Um, well, it's interesting that Adrian and I are actually both um, consultants on Yucca Mountain to Nevada, so the story continues. And actually, radioactive waste is one of the most challenging societal problems because it's so long-lived. So um, the assessment scenarios run out for a million years, and we're trying to come up with, and Richard's 
is still a consultant. Um, and we're trying to work out um, uh, what landscapes might look like in a million years' time, what hydrology might look like, and hence what the ultimate risk of failure of a repository might look like. And just for, <clears throat> uh, you might like to know, we don't think that Yucca Mountain's a very good idea. <laughs> It'd be much better to put it in Saskatchewan. <laughs> okay. Um, we talked a lot about low car. Um, low car was um, driven, it was a science program, um, but and, and it, it did a, a job in integrating surface and groundwater hydrology, but also actually quite a bit of work on freshwater ecology. So we did some really interesting work tagging fish and understanding their migration, because some of these southern rivers have had um, massive declines in salmonid populations, for example. Um, and there's lots of issues around uh, the causal factors for that. Um, I don't really want to spend much time because Ad uh, Adrian did a great job in, in, in explaining that and, and Dennis all referred to it, but um, I think it highlights the need for large-scale instrumented basins pulling together surface water and the groundwater and also understanding the chemistry. And Nicholas, of course, also referred to this, the, the fact that we've got this 30-year nutrient uh, lag time in the system um, and then the interesting issues in terms of drought management. And as I can't remember who mentioned it, probably Dennis, the fact that um, if London has more than two dry winters, it, <clears throat> then it, it, it goes dry. And that was a major threat when the uh, London Olympics was about to happen. Uh, it was a real concern the taps might be turned off. So um, I think Adrian was right in a sense that um, this was a... Set, set, set a pattern which we ultimately picked up with uh, the uh, work in, in Canada. Beth um, took us to Wales. Um, this was another um, interesting uh, issue. So the UK through the 70s and 80s um, was not particularly floody. Um, but then the 90s came along and um, suddenly there was a lot of flooding in the major river systems. And um, one of the questions was, well, what has the effect of agricultural intensification been in the headwaters which deliver most of the water into these rivers? Um, and this is a, a rather benign picture of a Welsh landscape. Um, but actually, with uh, European Union policy, um, then um, the number of animals uh, per square area had increased by a factor of five. Um, and the weight of the animals, individual animals, had doubled. Um, so uh, the results were severe compaction of the landscape and quite significant change of the hydrological processes. And so there was a lot of interest in uh, uh, how to manage that and um, introducing shelter belts uh, and planting trees on the landscape um, to encourage infiltration. And, um, uh, and that was really the birth of um, Beth's work that she talk to us about with polyscape and so on, and the need to understand the spatial location of interventions for them to be effective, and also the need to trade off multiple um, benefits. So uh, if you plant trees in this landscape, you can help uh, mitigate flooding, and uh, you can also improve habitat, and you can also improve water quality. Um, this was fairly widely recognized um, uh, in subsequent UK policy. We were participating in various national um, flood inquiries and presenting evidence to the House of Commons and so on. Um, there is, of course, a danger that um, uh, rural land management is seen as a panacea for flood risk management. In fact, what this does is makes a huge difference to small floods and a very small difference to big floods. Um, so it's not a uh, the solution to downstream flooding, but it's with uh, uh, sustainable management, um, uh, a partial solution to many challenges in the uplands. And uh, with Beth's work and, and, and others, um, we were able to take physically based models to understand and model these processes and turn them into simpler tools for regional application. And Beth showed you it being applied out over Wales and now in New Zealand. Our experimental setup. And actually, the other thing about this was it was the first time I'd done a project working very, very closely with stakeholders. And this was in conjunction with um, uh, uh, a wonderful 
uh, cooperative of Welsh sheep farmers, led by a very uh, inspirational guy, Roger Dukes. Um, and it was his leadership uh, that uh, really led to this initiative. Um, and his leadership led to them actually being recognized um, by the Welsh government and included in policy discussions. And ultimately, he uh, very nicely got um, an, um, uh, ennobled, well, he got um, MBCB, something like that, uh, from, the, uh, from Prince Charles, Prince of Wales, who came to, came to visit. Um, okay, um, so that was a, another interesting area of societal challenge where we needed to go and do experiments, understand the systems, and then produce tools. Um, I took, mentioned just briefly um, a few cases I've done at the International Court, and uh, Francisco gave us a nice uh, little int introduction to uh, the Salala, which is the current dispute between Chile and Bolivia. And um, each of these three cases, um, Hungary, Slovakia was about uh, the impact of building dams on the Danube for um, power generation and uh, navigation, and had major impacts on wetlands, riparian wetlands. Argentina, Uruguay was about nutrient loads in the river Uruguay and the effect of pulp mill effluents on eutrophication. Um, and Chile, Bolivia um, is really about um, what makes a river a river, <laughs> which is a kind of interesting question. And we've had such a lot of fun, as Dennis said, um, unscrambling this story of how this basin works. So it's really a case where we've the, the Chilean government has invested a lot in um, really interesting science so that we can understand the functioning of this system and hence present um, the case to the International Court um, uh, at some point in the next couple of years. <clears throat> okay, so this brings me to uh, Canada. And here we are in Saskatoon and um, uh, co-located at the Institute with... Um, Alan and the team in Environment Canada. Um, so Canada has plenty of problems, um, and you've heard quite a lot about these. Um, we've heard about um, floods, and we've heard about droughts, and we've heard about mine wastes, and we've heard about uh, eutrophication. Uh, Lake Winnipeg had an algal bloom that was 15,000 square kilometers, bearing in mind that the Thames is 10,000 square kilometers. Um, and then also um, we, we heard a little bit about the issues of source water and drinking water quality. And then on top of that, we've got this amazing story of um, uh, warming. So everything is changing in the north really fast. Um, so uh, we've reduced the duration of snow cover by up to two months in the year. <coughs> As you heard, um, winter minimum temperatures are up in the north by up to 8 degrees C. And we've got um, uh, in the Yukon rivers that have changed direction because of glacier retreat. So um, there's really a spectacular range of challenges that means that we really um, needed to do a better job of understanding the systems and how they behave in all their respects uh, to help Canada manage these problems. So I came along with um, $30 million to spend which was um, an amazing opportunity. And um, this is our river basin. So we spent most of the money <clears throat> um, uh, trying to understand the Saskatchewan River Basin. You've heard a lot about it. The important points are that uh, uh, most of the water comes from the Rocky Mountains. And as John was saying earlier, it's an exotic river in the prairies. And the prairies have a very complicated landscape. But in water resource terms, it's very interesting because um, the South Saskatchewan River in Alberta is fully allocated. There's no more water resource available. And there's very, um, and, and um, uh, 86 percent of the water consumptive use is for irrigation. So it's the problem Stephen was talking about, about agricultural water use. Um, so uh, that's a very interesting challenge, um, particularly given the need for economic growth and population growth. Um, the other thing is that um, there's a lot of pressure of nutrients. Um, so as the uh, pristine headwaters from the Rocky Mountains move down through Alberta into Saskatchewan, 
um, they pick up a, a massive load of uh, phosphorus. Um, and um, it was interesting that Alberta set a guideline of 0 0.05 milligrams per litre, but seeing as some of its rivers were routinely in order of magnitude greater, it decided it would throw away the guideline. <laughs> um, and um, so, that, so nutrients are a challenge. And then, of course, extreme events um, that we've heard about, prairie drought and recent floods. So the city of Calgary um, going underwater in 2013 um, was um, a five to six billion dollar uh, uh, disaster. So um, what we did was to set up the river basin as a big observatory. And um, this um, uh, really followed on an initiative that uh, had begun by the global community under the World Climate Research Program of trying to look at large basins. But <clears throat> we took this um, um, to move much further than just thinking about the water and energy cycle, but thinking about the management issues that are faced in the province. So the questions are, of course, extremes and climate change, but also water quality, and then um, ecosystem health. And so we have endangered species. Um, and we also have um, something we haven't talked about here in the last couple of days, but the Saskatchewan Delta. So this is a really important area. It's about 10,000 square kilometers. It's the largest freshwater wetland system in North America. Um, and it's downstream of uh, all this development, and in particular, uh, the Diefenbaker Dam, um, and also uh, another dam just upstream. And it's the home to um, some communities of First Nations, um, Cree and Métis First Nations. Um, so, what we decided to do was to build on the legacy of uh, observatories and strengthen them. And we invested a lot, um, uh, together with John, in expanding the Rocky Mountains monitoring capability. So he's got running more than 50 sites um, in the Rocky Mountains. We inherited the marvelous boreal forest berms sites for looking at carbon, water, and energy fluxes from the boreal forest. We've got several um, important sites in the prairies, St. Denis, um, Keniston, the soil moisture, um, multi-scale soil moisture site, um, uh, Smith Creek that we heard about from John, um, and also Swift Current where Jeff has been uh, uh, working. Um, so they were, those were mostly looking at physical processes, but then we done a lot of work on water quality in various lakes, and in particular, we invested a lot of money trying to understand the behavior of Lake Diefenbaker um, and nutrient loadings. And there's been some really interesting work developing models um, to predict uh, vulnerability for nutrification. Um, one of the um, interesting events that we've had over the last few years, there's a virtual catchment um, which takes water from Diefenbaker to feed Regina. And it goes through a small lake called Buffalo Pound. And um, Regina lost its water supply, a quarter of its water supply, a year or so ago because of eutrophication, um, screwing up the treatment work. So um, uh, Helen Bolsh in particular has been doing a lot of work on that. So <clears throat> we've been trying to put together a set of observatories that allow us to understand the system response, improve our models, but also to um, build on some of the management issues. And, um, and so what we did was to... Um, put together um, teams, uh, multidisciplinary teams, to understand the challenges of these very different areas. And um, uh, is Tim Jardine around anywhere? Tim, I don't know. Anyway, Tim, um, one of our, our, our young toxicology colleagues, has done a, a phenomenal job in pulling together um, a really interdisciplinary program looking at the challenges in these, uh, in these wetlands. So we've had changing flow regimes, we've had episodic pulsing of the river flow because of hydropower generation. Uh, it's actually a, a system which um, had a natural evulsion um, uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, and it's the home, as I say, to First Nations. And their livelihoods are all around hunting, fishing, and trapping, um, and the um, tourism activities associated with that. So Tim put together a team that um, looked at the changing hydrology, looked at the impacts on the ecosystems and ecosystem health, including mercury toxicity. Um, and then we had the social science program um, 
uh, led by Graham Strickert, um, looking at the impacts on livelihoods and also some work on the economics of the system. So it's just a very nice story. Um, but illustrate, I, I mention this because it illustrates that we really need to um, pull together the disciplines to really tackle these complex management challenges. And that's one of the things we've been doing over the last seven years. Just a few pictures, Rocky Mountains, Boreal Forest, Prairie Research Sites, uh, and uh, Lake Diefenbaker, 200 kilometers long, Lake Diefenbaker. And when it was built, it was the largest earth dam in the world. <clears throat> um, and um, we've also done other experimental work. And, and Lee Barber, is Lee still around? Um, was, was chairing this session earlier. Um, Lee has done the most phenomenal amount of really interesting work uh, to do with landscape reclamation. And the oil sands, uh, um, as Sean was saying uh, earlier, are um, um, a tremendous opportunity for research into very large scale environmental perturbations. Um, and then, actually, I'm going to have a caption competition for this photograph. So we, we, should, we should have a little bubble. And, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, as Sean said, we have the, uh, the mine overlay test, uh, site testing facility um, that um, uh, is, um, Jeff's having a lot of fun with, uh, and Vaver. And uh, it gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility um, to manipulate uh, hill slopes and do some really interesting hydrology, including manipulating temperature. Um, but um, it's interesting that kind of what goes around comes around because um, one of my early papers was um, 1989, um, an apparatus for laboratory catchment studies at uh, Imperial College. <laughs> um. <clears throat> so we need experimentation at multiple scales. Um, we had CCRN came along. This was um, an interesting uh, opportunity presented by the federal government to address environmental change in Western Canada, focus, focusing quite narrowly on the um, physical and biological systems, um, looking at the changing cryosphere, hydrology, and terrestrial ecosystems. Um, and this was an important study in a couple of reasons. One is that it expanded our um, sets of observatories uh, and our basins to include the Mackenzie and go right up to the subarctic. Um, it brought together eight universities and four federal agencies to, to do this. So we had a terrific community of uh, researchers and it completes this month. So we've spent the first two days of this week in, in this room um, putting, putting this um, story to bed, um, but it's a story of spectacular change and the use of these observatories to understand that change, to diagnose it, to develop improved models, and then to come up with scenarios of what the future might hold for us. And it's been a very nice integrator between the ecological communities and the hydrological communities, and Jen was, has been an absolute star in um, leading some of the ecological work. Uh, so, um, and then the next step, of course, is, uh, is global water futures and uh, moving on to um, uh, a pan-Canadian um, program. Um, so, one of the um, aspects of global water futures is uh, new observing systems and building on the capability that um, we have with new satellites and drones, new instrumentation. Um, and um, it, it's a, a very exciting opportunity. I'll come back to that at the end. <clears throat> um, so we've talked a little bit about um, experiments and observations. Um, I just want to say a little bit briefly about modeling decision support systems. So flood hydrology, um, uh, we both um, developed some conceptual modeling tools, but ultimately regional analysis was very powerful in um, giving us tools to um, quantify the impacts of urbanization. Um, we did quite a lot of work on flood hydrology, and Richard had, and, and Christian have talked about this um, in the 1990s. And one of the interesting things here is about the time lag, I think, because the, the models that we were applying 
um, to the UK and various other places that had originally been developed by um, Valerie Isham, David Cox, Ignacio Rodriguez de Turby, and uh, just validated on a little bit of a US data, um, probably a decade earlier, if I remember rightly. Um, and um, so it's taken about um, um, 20 years to get these tools to the point where they're quite widely used in Europe uh, and used to some extent in the UK for, um, for flood design. And uh, um, it's interesting that, um, that the flood design environment is very conservative and still uses intensity duration frequency curves and these artificial storm profiles which bear no relationship to um, uh, reality. So we really have to do a better job at trying to move these tools into uh, design practice in a conservative system. Um, these are some simulations from Richard as to um, using the generalized linear model of what rainfall at Heathrow Airport might look like in 2071. Um, uh, the interesting point here is that we heard from Dennis about the Irish flooding problem. That led to Richard to develop the generalized linear modeling package and GlimClim, uh, which has then been very widely used, not just for spatial rainfall modeling, but also for downscaling uh, a range of uh, global climate models. So an interesting um, little piece of applied research need, Western Ireland flooding, um, and, uh, and that's spun up uh, a new generation of models with very widespread application. Torsten um, talked a little bit about um, the work that we did <coughs> on developing modeling toolboxes, parsimonious models, and we were successful, uh, really for the first time, in cracking the issue of regionalization. <coughs> How to apply continuous simulation models um, on a national basis on ungauged catchments. Um, and that was uh, led to, we had various ideas about um, dyna dynamic identifiability analysis, but also working with Neil and subsequent students, we produced um, a regionalizable um, modeling platform. <coughs> so in terms of tools, um, then the 2000s, I talked a little bit about Pont Bren, and we produced simulation tools that enabled us to evaluate scenarios of land use change, and also at the same time to look at some of the issues of, of changing climate over different basins over the UK. Um, Mohammed Al Shami <laughs> is sitting over there. <coughs> um, so uh, the 1990s were interesting because um, um, this was an era where the global community was very influential, and GWEX was very influential in um, developing um, large-scale initiatives. So GWEX had the idea, World Climate Research Program's GWEX project had the idea that we should work on large basins and try and understand energy and water fluxes. And so this led in Canada to MAGS, which was the beginning of a whole series of important pieces of research. <coughs> and in the UK, it led to uh, a national research program, and that gave us funding to start looking at large-scale modeling, and um, that's one of the pieces of the puzzle that, um, uh, that uh, Mohammed El Shami um, worked on. So we, worked, uh, we had this wonderful paper called Moses and the Nile. It's not an original story. <laughs> uh, Moses is the Met Office Surface Exchange Scheme, uh, a land surface scheme, <clears throat> superseded by jewels. Anyway, it pretended that Lake Victoria was a large piece of soil and it didn't work very well. So Mohammed built a proper model and it worked very well. And, um, uh, and I should say that Mohammed has been one of the key members who's allowed us to take CCRN over the finishing post by developing the model of the Mackenzie. So he's the only guy that came to join our group um, uh, to work on the Mackenzie that had, had actually worked on a bigger catchment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've done lots of interesting things here, and you've heard a little bit from Roy Rasmussen about high-resolution atmospheric modeling. It's revolutionizing our capability for modeling. Um, and um, we've also um, done some large-scale modeling, and. This is Fuad's, some of Fuad's um, work, a uh, research student here. Um, and the interesting thing is, um, well, not only the link to Grayson and, and, and Jay, but the fact that it's an example of using remotely sensed data 
to help us condition um, large-scale hydrological models. And we're really at the beginning of a very long path and a very productive path that I expect where we progressively use remotely sensed products to improve our modeling capability. We've tried um, to come up with um, tools to look at uh, risk management of water resources in the prairies, so taking the hydrology into water resource management needs, uh, and uh, Elmira, somewhere in the audience perhaps, and uh, Ali have, um, have been working on water resource systems modeling, looking at vulnerabilities to climate change um, for the uh, province of Saskatchewan, and uh, these uh, diagrams show what happens if um, we have changes to the timing of flows and the magnitude of flows in the Rocky Mountains and what happens in terms of the economic benefit um, from di different management strategies um, in terms of um, hydropower generation and irrigation production. And um, we uh, have been working very closely with um, uh, Amin El Chabagi who came up with this idea of uh, looking at risk profiles for future climate. Okay. So lots of large-scale modeling work. Um, so we can look at uh, future changes on the Saskatchewan and the Mackenzie. And um, we've just got to the point last weekend where we're starting to get results of future climate and its impacts on the Mackenzie and also future land use and it, its impacts on the Mackenzie. So, um, a little history about decision support modeling and the diverse needs, and I didn't have time to talk about all the water quality work that we're doing um, in terms of lakes and river processes. But I wanted to um, say a few words about socio-hydrology. It's a path that Pat and I have trod um, over the last uh, uh, seven or eight years. Um, and it's uh, very much uh, an evolving area of hydrology. Um, recognizing that um, water is uh, not a natural system, but uh, it's a human natural system, and how do we understand and manage it as that broader entity? And I like to use the example of um, uh, the Saskatchewan River in Saskatoon, because the flow that you see down here um, really depends on human actions upstream. Alberta is free to take up to 50% of that flow. That changes the volume. We have a very large dam the, um, uh, upstream Lake Diefenbaker, and that's completely changed the natural flow regime to uh, what the flow regime that we have at the moment. So these are systems um, that if we want to model them, we have to understand and reproduce not just the physical flows, but the human interventions that moderate those flows. Um, and that's an important area of challenge. So we've been working to put water management into large-scale models, and that's a challenge because often it's not only us that don't understand the operating rules, it's also the operators that don't necessarily understand the operating rules. Um, uh, so that's an interesting area. We've been made, making progress in that area. And then John's talked about the issues around uh, agricultural land management, and, and that's been uh, huge uh, and very uh, impactful in terms of prairie hydrology. So there's physical infrastructure and physical effects that we need to understand, but when it comes to really thinking about this as a, uh, an integrated human natural system, then people and their attitudes become important. And um, so we've done a lot of work uh, led by Graham Strickert um, to understand values, and values ultimately translate into policies and political priorities. Um, so we've been doing work in that area. It's also important, I think, to communicate with the public. Uh, so we develop modeling tools that allow us to play games with um, uh, changing river flows, uh, and its impacts on the lakes and uh, downstream discharges, um, and also changing irrigation needs in the province, uh, and so on. Um, and then um, there's the huge challenge of communicating um, the results in an effective way with stakeholders. And we kind of touched on this a little way. Tony, uh, in the last two days, Tony Jankman gave a very inspiring talk about the need to engage um, stakeholders, how to engage stakeholders, and the means to engage stakeholders. And this is um, 
one of Pat's pictures about the decision center that she created uh, at Arizona State and something that's still a twinkle in our eyes for the university here. Um, we've also been seeking to engage communities. So Walter was talking about um, <coughs> the need to build grassroots support through sensors and sensing. Um, we've also, um, particularly through our toxicology colleagues, been doing a lot of work um, with, um, with First Nations uh, on, on things like fish health. Their primary concerns are the water safe to drink, or the, is the fish safe to eat? And then Graham's done a, a most uh, um, amazing job of reaching out to the public. And uh, this is a play that uh, we put on uh, in 2014 called Downstream that toured the Saskatchewan Basin, um, where um, the uh, audience were also actors and, uh, and, and participated in the evolution of the plot. So a very imaginative piece just to bring awareness of these issues in, into the public dimension. So. That's a little run through, a rather long run through, sorry John, <coughs> um, the past, but I'm just going to say a few words on the next 40 years as I hand over the baton to John and to Jay and to Jeff, the three J's. <laughs> okay, um, so this is our um, vision for Global Water Futures and it's my vision for the future. Um, we live in an era of very exciting um, opportunities around new data. And as we already heard from Eric, the vast quantities of data mean that we're now going to be operating in the cloud in terms of data access. Um, and then we've got exciting possibilities in terms of um, information sharing and uh, <coughs> Kathy gave us a nice example of um, a mobile phone app for Beijing where you could look at air pollution. So we're developing mobile apps um, for uh, flood risk and also systems where users can report information on extreme events as they occur. Um, so this little um, diagram I think encapsulates um, the way forward. There's lots of exciting things happening new sensor technologies, well, to talk a little bit about cheap sensor technologies, but John talked about drones and low-cost satellites. We're going to have high-resolution sensing globally. Um, we can already see a lot on the land surface, but we don't do a very good job of making use of that information. We've got really exciting opportunities of measuring water levels everywhere from space, and that will transform our ability to condition models and predict um, and also, we can sense increasingly aspects of water quality from space. <coughs> the big challenge, as Dave Rudolph pointed out, um, is, um, and Dennis, um, how do we see the subsurface? Uh, Grace, as, as Jay showed us, has been a huge um, transformative initiative, but only applicable at a large scale. Um, John Selka in the US is developing microscale gravity sensors that will be cheap and in principle could be deployed extensively and would do the same job at the small scale. Um, in, 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 um, in various locations, um, we're, we're using optical fibers in rivers to understand groundwater, surface water interactions through temperature change. Um, I see a future where we can put all this information together and do a much, much better job at seeing the subsurface. Um, but this really has to be through inverse modeling uh, as well as um, uh, remote sensing. Um, and it's a huge area of need, but a great area of opportunity. Um, there's been a, a discussion for a long time about um, low-cost water quality sensors. They're still problematic, but over the next few decades, they will be transformative. Um, we need to um, pull together water quality data at high temporal resolution and high spatial revolution, resolution. If we do that, it will take us to a new era of trying to understand how catchments behave. And Jeff is taking us a good chunk of the way with isotopes, but if we can combine that with a much more extensive set of sensors, um, that will be really powerful. And then when we think about aquatic systems, then the current revolution in um, genetics 
uh, and eDNA monitoring is, is, will transform our capability, not only to understand invasive species presence, but also to understand the, the health and vulnerability of aquatic ecosystems. So it's really exciting opportunities there. <clears throat> um, what this is gonna do is to do lead to global models, and we've seen that they're nearly there. We will have global drought forecasting, we will have global flood forecasting, um, uh, probably in the next decade, if we get our act together, if we wander along, it might take a little bit longer. Um, uh, there's a real challenge of trying to produce global groundwater models, but they will exist and will be progressively conditioned with data. Um, and then this information will be made available to the public in ways that are accessible to them in a way that's meaningful to their own uses, so it'll be targeted to, to users. Um, what we need to see and what we will see is a much closer involvement of the social sciences um, because the big issues are all about how society makes decisions. Um, so we need to understand values, we need to understand policy and economic instruments, and we need to improve our capability to make decisions about uncertain futures. And there's a whole area of work there that's really important and it's in its infancy in terms of acceptance. Um, lots to do on human health and Corrine Schuster-Wallace is just joining us as a new faculty appointment in uh, Water and Health. Um, the future is gonna present a whole series of health challenges. Um, uh, insect vectors uh, affecting disease, um, but also uh, extreme events floods and droughts expecting health, affecting health in many ways. Um, we, <clears throat> then, I think the bottom line is we've heard a lot of stories which um, illustrate that we're going to be moving into a, a future where we've got some really exciting science tools, but we've got some incredibly um, challenging uh, societal issues. So, for sure, we've got more people. They need more food and more energy and more water and it's a warming world, so there are going to be more people and more places at risk, um, and that's going to also affect water quality and put even more pressure on our aquatic ecosystems. And Philippe very nicely demonstrated um, the global effects of dams. So that's a challenge for society that we're going to have to face. Um, and I think that uh, it's clear that it's going to be increasing competition for scarce resources. It's not really a question about managing water sustainability. It, sustainably, it's a question of managing competing interests between the environment and different human interests. And that might well lead to conflict um, at, uh, at different scales. And so governance is going to be a key frontier. And we heard... Um, some really um, conflicting stories about governance. So from Claudia, um, we heard about the Cape Town story. It's been known about for a decade, but there's been no action. Um, uh, and then from Kathy, um, we heard the story of China. And um, one of the things, Kathy's talk, uh, she mentioned greetings from her husband. <laughs> her husband, Jining, of course, has just stepped down as Minister of the Environment for China, currently mayor of Beijing. And um, to, as Minister of Environment, um, he was just hugely influential in changing the story uh, of China um, in terms of uh, production focus um, to um, maintaining healthy ecosystems and, and all the tough choices that have to be made. So governance is a key frontier. We have uh, Jining Chen is our role model for China um, and I think uh, what we need is John Pomeroy is the next Prime Minister for Canada, um, and then he'll be able to sort these problems out. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to finish. I've spoken for much too long. It's been such a wonderful delight uh, to see you all here. Um, I'm so happy that uh, uh, Global Water Futures has got funding under... John's leadership with many of you involved in this very exciting future. Um, Global Water Futures is about solutions to water threats. It's about um, working with people to meet their needs and answer their questions and it's gonna be transformative and uh, you're all gonna bring it through. And Pat and I will watch from the sidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you.